in the last evenings, last evening, he spends with the disciples before his death, Jesus tries to show them two elements of reality that are difficult to hold together. He is going away, and yet he will not leave them alone. Jesus had said, in a little while the world will no longer see me, but you will see me. And because I live, you will also live. In hearing this, the disciples pressed Jesus for some more information. And they ask, how is it that you will reveal yourself to us and not to the world? From this question, it may sound as if they are expecting Jesus to reveal some secrets. To give his followers knowledge hidden from the world at large. The answer Jesus gives, however, goes in another direction. Jesus is not interested in hiding knowledge from anyone. While the world will not see him any longer, it will see his followers. The words that follow here are for his followers, and yet it is not a coincidence that as his followers keep loving him, the world will see them keeping his word. To keep the word of Jesus means to keep his teachings. It is to wash one another's feet, to love one another. And as the disciples keep the word of Jesus, they will be a community characterized by mutual regard, love, and service. Hear now these words from the Gospel of John, chapter 14, verses 23 and 24. Jesus answered him, Those who love me will keep my word, and my Father will love them, and we will come to them and make our home with them. Whoever does not love me does not keep my words, and the word that you hear is not mine, but it is from the Father who sent me. The word of the Lord. Will you pray with me? Lord Jesus, we thank you for these moments. We thank you that you love us so. And I pray that you will pour through me this day the word that you would have us hear. Not my word, but yours. Not my opinion, but your word that will meet us where we are, at our point of need, and prepare us for the work of your holy realm. In Christ's name I pray. Amen. There was a TV show a number of years ago called Hill Street Blues. Hill Street Blues. And it was identified as an American serial police procedural television series. It aired on NBC in primetime in the early 80s. And the show chronicles the life of the staff of one particular police station located on Hill Street, in an unnamed large city. Now, the opening of the show began the same way each week. The officers, having been given their orders for the day, they'd prepare to leave, and the sergeant, a stern but a kindly man named Esterhouse, always said this, be careful, be careful out there. Now, this morning, Jesus isn't telling his disciples that exactly, but he's equipping them for the holy task that he is leaving them to do. Now, I'm not, as you can imagine, a biblical scholar. I wish I had more time to be. But I'm an observer, and I'm a student. And oftentimes, I hear people say, well, just preach the gospel. Reasonable. But then I think, which one? Which one? Because each has its own perspective written for a different constituency. But each one attests to the resurrected Jesus. But we've said before, and I believe this with all my heart, that Scripture needs context. What is being written? When? To whom? By whom? Most important, why? There are passages in each testament, old and new, that require examination and can be agreed on or contested by people of faith. But I suggest that the people to whom it was written may have had a different understanding in their time as we may have two centuries later. But 
but I'm absolutely convinced of God's leading and the integrity of their intent. I'm absolutely convinced of God's direction, God's leading, and the integrity of their intentions. Now, our text for today is from what is known, as you heard Bill say, the farewell discourse in the Gospel of John. Extended teaching after supper and before his arrest. And Jesus seeks to make the most of these hours, of this last opportunity to be with them, using every moment and every way to imprint on them his method, his love, his humility. He commands them, love each other as I have loved you. And he tells them the one thing that above all others they must know and practice to prepare for life without him. He says, keep my words. If you love me, you will keep my word. If you don't keep my word, you don't love me. These last few weeks, we've engaged in stories punctuated with visions and trances. Remember, Saul rocked from his horse on the way to capture Christians in Damascus. Then the servant Ananias conscripted to seek out the persecutor Saul, who's been laid low, and then to be the agent of his return of his sight and his baptism. There was also Cornelius, the Roman commander, a man of faith, who was instructed in a vision to summon Peter. And of course, Peter. <laughs> Peter the impetuous, but known by Jesus as the one with the passion and with the abandon to be the rock of his church. So we've seen an array of folks in an early church narrative who are directed by the voice of God to do extraordinary things. Now of them all, I think Peter's vision was the most bizarre. You'll remember a blanket descending from the ceiling with animals forbidden to be eaten by observant Jews and a voice saying, get up, get up, kill and eat. And Peter protested, as you would imagine, nothing non-kosher has passed through these lips, he says. And then the voice of God says, what God has made clean, you must not call profane. Even to Peter, that was clear. So God spoke. Of all the things that God had spoken, recorded in our holy texts, it wasn't that Peter and his tribe could finally eat pork, but that those laws that were thought to keep one holy and undefiled were no longer necessary, no longer efficient or effective. You may recall in a similar situation when accused of disregarding dietary laws, Jesus had instructed that it wasn't what you put into your mouth that defiled, but what came out of your mouth, because it comes from your heart, the curses, the judgment, the meanness, all those things that destroy God's realm. So we move from table manners to God's word for living. So after supper, on that last night, after supper, Jesus seeks to assure the disciples that they will not be orphaned. He's already breathed the breath of life on them when he appeared to them after the resurrection. But for their comfort, he promises an advocate whom he says will be sent, but whom I believe we know is present at that moment and in this moment as well, the completion of the Trinity of the Godhead. He has given them the commandment that supersedes all they have known, simply love each other as I've loved you. And he says that the world will know you are mine if you love each other. Now in this moment, he gets real. He lets them know there are consequences for ignoring his instructions. Why? Because you cannot hide your heart. Those who love me, he says, will keep my word, and my Father will love them, and we will come to them and make our home with them. Jesus, the Father and the Spirit, Whoever does not love me does not keep my words. Now there is a consequence. And what is it? That they will not know the presence, the strength, the love, the peace of the indwelling Creator, Savior, and Holy Spirit of God. You know, there's really no gray area. There's no in-between. You keep my word or you don't. I preach the word or I don't. 
We at Second Presbyterian Church of Charleston, a church on the hill, keep God's word or we don't. You know, it's like asking a, someone at a wedding, do you promise to be with this woman and love her and cherish her as is God's intention for all her life? Well, what if he were to say, oh, maybe, <laughs> or, or for a couple of years, you know? No, it's all in or all out. Now, the question we have this morning is, why would we not keep God's word? Do we think our obedience depends on our interpretation? That if we're not sure of the meaning, there are ways to wiggle and to squirm out of situations that demand, in Jesus' name, clarity. If there is confusion, it's ours. It's not, as it says in some, some of the Bibles, the red-lettered words of Jesus. He says simply, from one testament to the next and to us today, feed those who are hungry, clothe those who are naked, visit those who are bound in prison or in the bounds and the binding of, of addiction. So why would we not? Are we afraid? Are we afraid we'll be judged for keeping Jesus' words? Well, we will be. Are we afraid of being sent, seen as too progressive by keeping the words of the radical, impassioned love, everybody, Jesus? We will be. Do we think we'll be shunned if we recognize and mourn what statistics reveal on the carnage done by guns designed for war, mass murders of innocents across supermarkets and churches from the beach, 19,000 suicides each year through guns. Are we afraid we'll offend? We're not talking sporting plays, men and women, or targets. We're not talking hunting for deer or doves in the field. Are we worried about the, are we worried about our future, forgetting that our future, the future of this church, the future of our children and our nation, of all God's created, is in God's hands? And our job is to be unafraid. Our job is to keep God's word. So will we embrace all people? Yes, we will. So it doesn't matter, remember, if you eat pork or plant-based. It doesn't matter if you wear cargo shorts or sport a tattoo and a bow tie. It doesn't matter if you're cradled a great Presbyterian, red letter evangelical, LGBTQ, a member of the Rotary or the Hibernian. It doesn't matter if you've been here or if you've come here. Men and women, we are all the people of God. Jesus has told the disciples and he tells us across the millennia not to expect an easy street. We are not called to comfort. We are called to obedience. We are to remember God's words. God's word. God's words are not a matter of opinion, nor manipulation. If we remember God's words, we will demonstrate God's love, and that love will enable and express justice and dignity and safety and opportunity for us and for all of God's created. If you love me, you will keep my word. If you don't keep my word, you don't love me. In the name of the Creator, the Spirit, the living Lord, who loves. In the name of Jesus, amen.